Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. I have a placer claim in one of the many creeks on the Grayback Mountain in Josephine County in Oregon. I don't want to be any more specific than that because I'd rather not share my identity, but you can call me Jake. One late October day, another miner called me and told me he'd seen four men on my claim. He didn't confront them because he was outnumbered Besides, he's an old-timer like me. My wife and I were packing up our trailer and getting ready to head for Yuma, Arizona for the season. The wet and foggy winters of Southern Oregon chill her to the bone. I decided I'd better investigate because I don't want stealing my meager supply of color. The next morning, I was up early, and while she finished prepping the trailer, I headed for my claim. It's not a very long drive, about 20 miles, and then it only takes an hour of hiking to reach it. When I got there, it was surely a mess. The trespassers had torn my claim signs from the trees and had been digging in the creek. They had left trash all over the place and had even made a fire pit. I'd brought my military shovel with me, so I got to work repairing the damage to the area and removing all signs of the fire pit. I didn't have anything to put the trash in, so I buried it with the idea that I'd pack it out when I return in the late spring. I didn't want any hunters or hikers to stumble upon the area and think it's suitable for a campsite. As I was trying to obliterate all traces of anyone having been there, it started to rain heavily and the temperature was dropping quickly. I hurried up the mountain a ways to find some shelter. There are several small caves and rocky overhangs in this area, and I was hoping to find one nearby that wasn't occupied by a black bear. By the time I found one and ducked inside, I was soaking wet. It was pretty dark, and I didn't hear the sounds of any critters, so I turned on my flashlight and slowly looked around the enclosure. I planned to build a small fire and dry out a bit before I hastened back to my truck. There, back in the far corner, was a mother Sasquatch and her very young infant at her breast. Being so familiar with the mountains of Southern Oregon, I immediately knew what I was looking at. This area is well known for being the home of Bigfoot, although I had never seen any myself before now. Mama looked every bit as surprised as I was, and she tightly wrapped her arms around her baby to protect it and snarled at me with nasty-looking fangs and reddish eyes that were like lasers. Before she could react any further, I quickly backed out of the shelter not wanting to cause her any more stress and also knowing that Papa must not be too far away. I moved hastily back down the mountain and stopped to look back after about 200 yards. Sure enough, here comes Mr. Sasquatch with a small deer over his shoulder. I believe I got out of there just in time. Before losing sight of the cave, I looked back once more to see the big Sasquatch standing guard outside the entrance. He needn't have worried. I surely wasn't going back there again. You may be surprised at how casually I report this, but long ago, I became acquainted with Sasquatch. About 12 years back, five other claim owners up and down the creek and I aided in keeping their identity a secret. We rather enjoyed having the big guys around. They make really good neighbors by keeping other animals like coyotes away. The wife sends me with stuff from the garden in season to leave out for them. There's a couple of big caves on one claim up above, 
and the claim owner let them live in there. By the time I got home, I was so wet and miserable and came down with a nasty cold the next morning. We had to postpone our trip south for a few days, and it was so nice to get down there into the warm sunshine. I've been seriously thinking I should sell my placer claim to a younger man and relocate to Arizona permanently. I know Jane would readily agree. I understand there are a lot of load mines on public land in Mojave County, so maybe the wife and I will take a ride up to Lake Havasu and check it out. On to the next one. I was raised in the great state of Washington. All my life, I've spent camping in the mountains. I'm well-versed in every species found in the Pacific. I'm familiar with owl calls, and this was clearly not one. At one in the morning, I was startled awake by an unexpectedly loud noise. This noise lasted for two hours and sounded like the howls of a large ape. The calls ended after I listened to it for two hours in order to see what happened. Other than that, I didn't pick up any other visuals or auditory clues. There was no mistaking the sound. It belonged to a primate. My mind is quite certain about that. On to the next one. On a 45-degree incline, I saw a huge, hairy, brownish-red monster striding erect and waving its arm. We looked out over an abandoned logging road. By using my binoculars, I was able to get a good look at its face. When it turned around to look at us, my brother desired to shoot the monster, but I wouldn't allow him to. As we rounded the bend in the road, I saw it first. It was out to my right, climbing a slope while wildly flailing its arms. Its head and neck swiveled to see those of us who had come to watch. It stared me down, and I saw it was a caveman-like creature with brownish-red hair covering its whole body. Skunk was definitely in the air. I saw it disappearing into the trees on my left around the next bend. I also discovered some very sizable footprints, and now I'm wishing I'd brought some plaster. When I get the chance, I'll definitely make some prints. This next spring or summer, I want to return to the area and do more research on our encounter. On to the next one. This was told to me by my mother. In Adams County, at around 7.30 p.m., they were finishing up and my son, who was 10, was outside the treehouse when he says he heard some chicken hawks squawking around a tree approximately a few hundred yards from him. He says he looked up and the tree was shaking, and then he saw a long tail hanging from the tree. He ran up into his treehouse and told his cousin he saw something. When my nephew looked out, he became scared and told Joe to run to the truck. They started to run to the truck when they heard a crashing sound. My nephew said he turned and saw, in his words, a monster-looking thing. It jumped from the tree and began to run toward them. They came to the house and were shaking so bad, my nephew was crying. He said it had red eyes, long arms with claws on its hands, and strange-looking feet for sure. Now... I drilled them and so did my husband because we wanted to make sure they kept to the story they had told us. They refused to go back to the treehouse by themselves, so the next day I walked with them there and they took everything down and said they hoped to never go back again. My son said to him it was a bad memory. You have to understand this son of mine loves the woods and is out there all the time. But now, he says, he will never go in the woods alone again. Now that spring is here and the leaves are out, I don't know how in the world we will ever get this thing. My husband told me a couple of months back when he was looking for my sister's dog, he saw what appeared to be a deer fur thrown around an area. 
no bones or anything, but deer hair, and it looked really strange. We don't know what's up here, but something surely is. On to the next one. In Ashtabula County in Ohio, I saw a dark shadow and first thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. But when I looked again, I saw the outline of a large man, but covered with hair. It was standing near the edge of the woods, and at first, I thought it was a statue. When I slowed down and looked closely, it started to move backward, taking small steps. This really frightened me, because even though I was in a car, and it was moving away, I realized then what it was, and that this thing was very much alive. The only way I can guess its height was by looking at the pine trees he was standing near, and I would say this creature had to be about upper six foot, maybe close to seven, with the broadest shoulders I have ever seen. If it was someone in a suit, it was someone that should be playing pro basketball, not standing along the edge of the woods. I was close to like 50 feet away from this thing at one point, and it was early in the morning. I watched until it went so deep that I could not see it anymore. It turned around, though, and started walking at a better clip after I slowed down and watched it for a while. I have not told anyone and never reported it. But when I was younger, I believed in Bigfoot. But now I am 26 and was very skeptical the last few years, knowing this thing, if it existed, would need hundreds of square miles of remote area to be out of sight of people. And I did not think anything in Ohio could accommodate that. Maybe out west it's more thinkable. But Ohio does not even have resident black bear or bobcat population. Could this mammal be so intelligent and elusive that it could remain in our modern world? Does it bury its dead? I mean, somebody find out what's going on with this. I know what I saw. I was driving in the morning like maybe 9 a.m., just enough light to see clearly, but the sun was not up to high over this area of woods, hence the shadow. I was by myself, unfortunately. I would have loved a second set of eyes near me. I was driving from Goga County to Reading, Pennsylvania. It was one of those real thick pine forests, but not real big, just one of those patchy areas that turn up in the middle of oaks, maples, and birch. A lot of northeastern Ohio is like that, and it just gets more like that when you get into the hardwood pines of the mountains of Pennsylvania. The elevation was around 1,000 to 11,000 feet. I would imagine slightly rolling, but seemed like a flat area. On to the next one. In Butler County, Ohio, my friend's family owns around a hundred acres of a woodsy area of Ohio with a vast web of creeks and streams. One day while wandering with my best friend through branches of creeks, we stopped to swim because we were getting hot. We were wading through the deeper area, challenging one another to catch minnows with a small cup. While trying to succeed at catching the fish, my friend came across a small animal skull, vertebrae, with a femur with fresh muscle and fur still attached. We examined the remains closely and drew the conclusion that it was once a raccoon. This struck as odd, featuring it was lying on the creek bank and was still slightly bloody, yet no other piece of the animal could be found. While my friend was still examining the bones, something provoked me to look up the creek. What I saw will forever be etched in my mind. It was a tall, lumbering brown figure. At first, we thought it was a bear, then a human. It dawned on us that it was actually a Sasquatch, which locals say roams the area and has been spotted by several others. It looked to be anywhere from six to eight feet tall when standing erect. It was covered in thick brown fur and its chest and face were the only body parts not covered in fur. The flesh of its chest and face was a tanned and tough-looking skin. 
It was about 20 yards away from us, stooping over something and hitting it with a rock. It then stood up, looked at us, and ran off like a bat out of hell. My friend and I stood there in shock for several seconds, trying to analyze what we had just seen. To this day, we both swear on our lives that it was a Sasquatch. On to the next one. In Guernsey County in Ohio, after listening to some Bigfoot recordings I found online, I played it for two friends of mine, and we all agree that is exactly what we heard. In the summer, we were working on a cabin that my friend was building in Guernsey County, about three miles from Senga Lake. At around 2 a.m., we were awakened by a series of screams. We had no idea what they were. Later, we figured they were a bobcat. When I listened to those Bigfoot recordings, I am positive that is what we heard, and everyone agrees. I have heard it one other time, but not since. My friend, who owns the cabin, and his son also has heard the scream on other occasions. I was dreaming when I was awakened. I think I may have heard a howl in addition to a series of screams, but I can't be sure. The weather was hot and dry. On to the next one. In Portage County in Ohio, while doing some early season scouting for deer season in a remote part of West Branch State Park, I noticed a set of strange tracks that looked very fresh. At first, they looked human, but I thought it was odd a person would be walking barefoot in some of the nastiest, deepest, and thick mud slop around. The inlet along the shores of a lake was covered with pricker bush and briars. I followed the track for about 400 yards until they cut through a mud swamp. A person would have taken the easy dry trail. These tracks went through the mud swamp. I tried to step through the swamp, but sunk over my boots. That's when I looked really hard at the tracks. They were not outrageously long, I say about a size 10, but they were very narrow and they sunk a lot deeper in the mud than my 200-pound frame did. The toes were very strange and appeared to be much longer than a human's. The left foot looked like it had suffered an injury to two of the interior toes. The stride was long, and I had to stretch to walk the same path. I'm six feet tall. I circled around the swamp and caught the tracks on the other side of the swamp inlet and followed for another 300 yards until I lost them back on dry ground where they went into the forest. I saw them midday on a hot summer day. It had been dry, but a little shower of rain had occurred a few days prior. There were no rain puddles in the tracks, so my guess is the tracks were no more than a day old. Well off the beaten path, plenty of thick briars and brush along a mud swamp on the shore of the lake. The tracks appear to go into a deep wooded ravine. I have spent many days and evenings hunting and fishing here. Prior to finding the tracks while night fishing, my friend and I heard loud wails and shrieking in the woods. It was not raccoons or owls and appeared to move quickly past our location. It was just me when I found them. I brought my buddy back a couple of days later to show him the tracks. The tracks were still visible, but had been weathered by a rainstorm. The reason I was there for scouting was for bow season. I was told by the owner of the local bait shop that back in the late 70s, he had seen a large fur-covered creature one night while fishing. The creature walked upright, was as tall as the average man. When he flashed his light on it, it ran up a steep embankment that was nearby. He said he would have needed climbing gear to go up this cliff, but this creature motored up it on two legs very easily. He did not feel like he was in any danger, but he was very close to it. I judge him reliable, and he is an outdoorsman, and I don't think he would confuse what he saw for local game creatures. On to the next one. 
in Vermilion County in Indiana. A friend and I had a cookout one Friday evening and kept hearing horrible screams and smelling some nasty smells. We finally went in for the night and decided to investigate on Saturday. While out on Saturday, we walked into the heavily wooded area, following a power line. The whole time we were out, we felt as if we were being followed. Closer to the creek, we began to see a large, biped figure moving toward the creek. We got scared and headed back toward the road. On the way, we noticed a large footprint in the fresh mud. Later in the month, we found unusual hair on a barbed wire fence. Our zoology teacher ran tests but couldn't determine the origin. In the fall of every year now, we go out looking and are still finding unusual things. I'd love to help some real researchers seek Bigfoot in this area. I'm very well educated and can be trusted. Constantly hearing noises of diabolical scream sounds heard every fall since. It is a heavily wooded area near Brulette's Creek in southern Vermilion County, about four miles southwest of Clinton. On to the next one. In Monroe County in Indiana. Hindustan is the nearest village, only a few homes and small church, perhaps three to four miles away on Old 37. This incident took place in the Morgan Monroe State Forest. On the main forest road, this took place while on the last day of firearm deer season in November. It was after sunset, but not yet dark. The temperature was in the mid 30, but the ground wasn't frozen and there were still patches of snow on the ground in places. I came out of the woods, put my shotgun, heavy winter coat, and day pack in the trunk of my car, and got inside my car to start it up when a movement to my left caught my eye. I will tell you what I saw, and what I thought it was, and what I thought as I was seeing this happen. This man, Bigfoot, came out of the thick brush, between the tree to my left on the opposite side of the road from where I was parked, maybe 35 or 40 yards down the road at an angle. But it had to know that I was there, or at least that my car was. When I first saw this thing coming out of the thick brush, the first thing I thought was, where the heck did he come from? Then I thought, stupid guy, no Hunter Orange. And then I began to notice strange things like he had no gun and that he was the same color from head to toe. No hat, no hunter orange, but then what I really noticed was that his arms were long. His hands were swinging at his knees as though he was taking large steps crossing the road very quickly, but without running. He was just walking. His arms were swinging wide like a British soldier marching, but he didn't seem to be in any hurry, and he completely ignored me like I wasn't there. But he had to know that I was there. He did not look over and kept his head looking straight ahead. When he went into the woods on my side of the road, the side I was parked on, and went down the hill and disappeared. My eyes told me that I just saw a Bigfoot, but my brain and common sense was trying to dispute that. His color was dark brown, and I thought, could that have been a man in a one-piece Carhartt outfit? Or if he were a hiker lost, wouldn't he just have stayed on the road rather than go down a steep hill when it was almost dark? Or if lost, why didn't he ask me for help? He was about six feet tall, but very husky, with his hands, body, feet, side of his head, face, all one color. I actually couldn't see fur because the light was dim. I could see the trees and the tree trunks fine, but not the bark because the tree trunks were silhouetted and that's what I mean about not seeing the fur. It was all one shade of dark brown. Now, all of this that I just told you took place in a minute or less. Soon as it disappeared over the side of the hill, 
I jumped out of my car, opened the trunk, and loaded my shotgun for self-defense only. I put on my winter coat and got my flashlight out of my day pack and walked to where I thought the thing went over the hill. I wanted to check out what I saw and was hoping to find a footprint on the ground or on a patch of snow, and I went slowly back and forth traversing this rather steep hill, going a little deeper down as I moved, back and forth. There was a deep, like gorge on the right side of the hill, and I looked up toward the road, and by now the ridge was on top, was just a sliver of gray, and looking over my shoulder, I realized this was not too smart. It was pitch black below me, and I got a little scared and hiked back up to the road and to my car as fast as I could. I placed my shotgun back in the case along with my heavy coat, putting them in the trunk, and then I drove up and down the main forest road to see if there were any cars parked off in the sides or if there was anyone walking. I saw nothing. I drove to the valley road where I thought this thing would eventually come out at the bottom of the hill into farm fields, and I drove back to the end of this valley and back, hoping to see something, but I saw nothing. I've told my wife, children, teenage goddaughters, brothers, and two close hunting buddies, but have always been hesitant to make a report. The truth is, though, I'm sure what I saw wasn't a man. I can't prove it wasn't a man dressed up in a suit, but who would be that stupid especially during deer hunting season. I can't say positively that it was a Bigfoot, but that is what my eyes saw. Logic says no, my eyes say yes, and that's my report the best I can remember it. I'm glad to get this off my chest. I came back the very next day to see if I could find footprints in the soft ground from the snow melt or on the remaining patches of snow, but I saw absolutely nothing, and as large as this creature was, I was hoping to see, in the daylight, at least something, but I saw nothing. I was alone. There were no other witnesses. On to the next one. This was near Centerville in Wayne County in Indiana. My buddy and I do extensive camping in this area, and we were raised here. We have heard many strange noises, but on this particular night, we were camping in an old corn crib, and around 2 p.m., we heard a very loud growling, hollering noise that woke both of us up from sleep. We both looked at each other in disbelief, but decided not to let that bother us and go back to sleep. Within a few minutes, we heard the same noise again, only this time louder and much closer. We have heard coyotes and screech howls, but we have never heard anything remotely similar to the sound. The next day, while sitting in safety in our homes, we discussed what we had heard and thought about Bigfoot, but who had ever heard of a Bigfoot in Indiana? Everything seemed normal prior to our nighttime visit. They were just the two of us, and we were both sound asleep. It occurred at around 2 a.m. at night. It was extremely dark. Noise was in the woods. We could not see anything, only the noises we heard and the hair on the back of our neck standing up. The environment consists mainly of hard woods with intermittent corn and soybean fields. The woods are mostly undeveloped due to deep ravines. Small areas of the woods are a little swampy with intermittent patches of pine wood. A local family were all riding their dirt bikes in the woods and one of the bikes became disabled, so everyone stopped to work on the bike, at which time they saw a creature watching them from a distance that appeared to be tall and hairy. On to the next one. In Morgan Monroe, date for it. Near Martinsville, in Morgan County, in Indiana. Hidden in the wilds of Morgan Monroe State Forest is a body of water called Lost Lake. Even the locals have trouble finding it. There is no road to it. A group of three men raccoon hunted this area regularly and 
had over 25 years. They drove in so far and hiked the final half mile to the lake. Their raccoon dogs seemed to get very excited as they approached the hidden lake and the men figured there had to be raccoons everywhere. One of the men that had one of the dogs pulling hard on its lead kept thinking that something in the forest was following him. Finally, the men decided it was time to let the dogs go before they went crazy. The moment the dogs were released, there was a loud crack that came out of the forest right behind them. When they turned around to see what had made the noise, they were about 15 feet away from what had to be the largest man they'd ever seen. Covered with hair, the man was about nine feet tall and was staring them down and was not at all afraid of the three men. The men stood motionless and watched as it simply turned around and walked into the darkness of the forest. The men finally got their dog called in and very quickly hiked back to their trucks. They never hunted this area again and said they would never return to Lost Lake day or night. On to the next one. Dallas County authorities were summoned to a home about six miles north of Adel late Thursday night after receiving reports of Bigfoot roaming through the area. Sheriff Deputy Craig Hine said he received a call from Larry Wilson of rural Milburn, who lives in a house about two miles north of Iowa 44 and in the vicinity of the Raccoon River. Wilson told Hine his two dogs started barking at about 9 p.m. After about half an hour, he went outside to investigate. He said he stepped outside the sliding glass doors of his split foyer home, but could not see anything because of the darkness. But he did hear heavy rhythmic breathing, Hine said. It was kind of a raspy sound, Hine was told. Wilson told Hine the dogs stopped barking, but he went upstairs and looked out the window. About 40 yards southwest of the house, Wilson saw it under a security yard light. Hine said, I don't believe in it and I'm not crazy. Hine said, Wilson told him. Wilson described the creature to Hine as a hunched over dark thing. Hine said, Wilson would not commit himself to say it was hairy, but he said it looked just like the pictures and drawings he has seen of Bigfoot. Hines said he and other authorities went to the home and saw 12 to 13 inch trampled prints in the frost covered grass. He said the strides were 48 inches from toe to toe. Contacted early today, Wilson said he heard a strange sound when he went to calm his dog. The only way I can describe it, it is like a horse snorting only real regular, a second or second and a half apart. Wilson said it worried him because he had never heard the sound before. I went in the house, locked the door, and was looking out the living room window when I saw it. It was about 40 yards from the house when it walked under the security light. It looked like a man in a gorilla suit. It looked like a man in a gorilla suit. I really couldn't estimate its height. It walked with a fairly long pace, and it had a definite arm swing. It might have had stooped shoulders, Wilson said. The creature was under the security light for only two or three seconds, so he did not get a chance to see any facial features. Wilson, 39, who has lived near the Raccoon River for the past six years, said he asked that his report not be publicized. I still do not believe this myself. I'm really shook. I've always been a skeptic, and had it definitely not scared the living hell out of me, I wouldn't be talking to you now, my friend, Wilson said in an interview. I've hunted, fished, and been out in the woods a lot, but I never saw or heard anything like that before. It was unnatural. On to the next one. Bryson David, 48, of Webster City, was looking for raccoon tracks early Friday morning near a wooded area 
by the Boone River. Instead, he found a seven-foot-tall animal that he said is a Bigfoot. The creature, which had long, thick, red hair down its shoulders and weighed about 450 pounds, was just lying there asleep, Davis said. But he said he must have spooked Bigfoot because he walked away quite fast in five-foot strides. Davis said the creature stands straight like a man, but doesn't like a human or an ape. He shined a flashlight on the departing creature, but was only able to see his backside. He said he was able to get within 18 feet of the animal. After the creature departed into the brush, Davis contacted authorities who checked the area but found nothing. Meanwhile, Davis has volunteered to take a lie detector test to prove the validity of his claim. There is no joke about this, he said. I suppose a lot of people don't believe and are laughing. I could care less. He said he was too dumbfounded to be scared once he spotted the animal. If he had been walking towards me, you bet I would have been scared, he added. Davis is determined, once he gets free time, to search for the animal. He suspects the animal could be staying in the ravines near the river, which he said is a pretty wild area. He is planning to buy a good camera to take pictures as positive proof that Bigfoot does exist. On to the next one. An Illinois Central Gulf Railroad engineer said he saw the meanest animal I've ever laid my eyes on as he chugged along the tracks in his engine in this area last month. Cyril O'Brien, 62, said, I've been traveling these tracks for 38 years now, and I've never seen anything like that. It was the second time Bigfoot-like animal tracks or animals have been spotted in this area in recent weeks. On January 21st, two farmers reported strange tracks in the snow as they surveyed their farmland for areas to plant trees. Delaware County Sheriff Bert Elge was called and he took photos of the tracks. He showed the photos to Conservation Officer Jim Becker, who said he couldn't identify them. The tracks have been lost in new snowfall, but Edgel is having the photos enlarged so Becker can get a better look. The tracks apparently made by the creature that walked on two feet, measured nine and a half inches long and four and a half inches wide. Edgel, a hunter for many years, said he had never seen tracks like that before, and because they were found in an isolated area, he is curious and suspicious. Engineer O'Brien of Waterloo said he saw the animal at a distance of less than 100 feet. He said as the train approached, the animal looked up and moved backward. It was big, much bigger than a dog, and at first I thought it might be a calf, O'Brien said. It was a heck of a mean-looking thing with long yellowish hair, a flat face, and short ears. It had no tail, O'Brien said. Then he noticed the carcass of what appeared to be a cow where the animal had been standing and believed it was feeding on the carcass. O'Brien said the animal walked on four legs. He said he radioed three other trainmen in the caboose and they also saw it and agreed it was indeed a strange creature. Agile declined to link the tracks and the yellowish creature. The tracks and sighting were about six miles apart but he said there appears to be a strange animal in Delaware County, and he's concerned that someone might get hurt. Bigfoot is a legendary hairy creature of the Northwest United States that walks upright. Some persons believe it exists and can provide a link between animals and humans. Sightings of strange hairy creatures have been reported in western Iowa for more than a year. On to the next one. Bigfoot rears his hairy head in Iowa again. Many sightings reported in Delaware County, Manchester, Iowa. Delaware County Sheriff Bert Edgel never strays far these days without the tranquilizer gun he keeps in his office. That's because Edgel has become the latest in a growing list of Iowa sheriffs who believe 
that there just might be something to all the talk about Bigfoot. Edgel isn't the kind of man who courts publicity. Quiet and practical, he prefers to keep a low profile and even shuns the effort of those who want to photograph him. But development in Delaware County during the past two months have brought the press to his door. Since January 15th, other Delaware residents, solid, practical men like the sheriff himself, have come to Edgel with tales of strange-looking creatures roaming the countryside. On his desk, the sheriff has a file that has grown thick with the testimonies of what they've seen. There's been too many sightings, Edgel said last week. These people have got to be seeing something. From the descriptions provided from the witness, Edgel's nephew, Tommy Edgel, 15, of Edgewood, a budding young artist, drew a sketch of the creature. The sheriff said two witnesses who said they got a close look at the creature say the drawing, which resembles the legendary Bigfoot, is a true likeness. Rural residents who live near here are curious and puzzled about the sightings. One farmer who asked that his name not be used said farm folk are asking themselves, could there really be a creature like that in these parts? Deputy Dick Snyder said that though puzzled by the sightings, country people are taking the situation in stride, and he knows of no one who is arming for protection. There, If there is a strange creature in these parts, there's evidence it's been here for some time. Edgel turned up a witness who says he saw a frightening sight just north of Manchester. The sighting in September was reported by Jerry Irwin, who at the time was a service manager for a Manchester auto dealer. Irwin, who now makes his home in Colorado, said in a phone interview last week that on the day of the sighting, he had driven his pickup truck into the country. I intended to spend my noon lunch period hunting squirrels, says Irwin. I drove about five miles north of town and pulled into a clearing got out of the pickup, and in a field about a hundred yards away, I saw a strange man-like animal walking alone. It was about a foot taller than a normal man, and was covered with hair, and it was big, real big, going at about 400 pounds. I'm a hunter, and I've seen lots of wild animals, but I've never seen anything like that before. I couldn't believe my eyes. On to the next one. It went into some woods, then came out and looked at me. We looked at each other for maybe five minutes. I wanted to get a better look, but all I had was a twenty two caliber rifle, and I didn't want to get too close. That sighting was not followed by a rash of others, but in January of this year, such reports surfaced. On January 13th, two Edgewood men came to the sheriff, and, after receiving insurances their names would be kept secret, told the sheriff they were driving south of Edgewood, which is 11 miles north of Manchester, when they saw a large form come onto the road from the abandoned farm. They said it came toward the car for several steps, then veered away. They said they got a good look at it in the headlights of their car, and that it was about 7 feet tall and weighed about 350 to 400 pounds. They said it had a large chest and very long arms and moved in an upright position. They also said it had a top knot on its head, sort of a pointed crown of hair, and that it had long hair extended from the top knot to its shoulders. The two said they were turned in the daylight, but were not able to track the animal. On to the next one. This was in Sailorville in Polk County in Iowa. At about 2 or 3 a.m., I was awakened by my St. Bernard puppy who was quite upset. I soon learned why as I could hear my neighbor's two dogs, a Great Dane and a Husky by the back of our house, crying loudly. I was almost 14 at the time and was quite scared by the commotion, as was my puppy. I looked out my window toward the cornfield and swamp behind the house but saw nothing but the dogs darting out toward the swamp. They started to go back out to the darkness in full attack mode. They weren't even barking, but like screaming at whatever was out there. I then heard a large rustling sound in the dried reeds by the fence line. It sounded as if the dogs had been hit, and they ran back to the safety of our back porch light. 
I ran to my mom's room, but found her at our back kitchen window staring towards the commotion. When the dogs would silence a little, we could hear something walking in the reed. It sounded very heavy, like a cow, but made no sound other than the walking noise and extra commotion when I believe it defended itself against the dogs. My neighbors across the street also watched from their front porch as this event continued for about an hour. Myself and my friends looked the area over from the safety of our dirt bikes about three days later as we were too scared to go out there after what had happened. We saw reeds smash down most of the length of the fence line and what looked like a deer lay, but it was overgrown and would have been tough to leave footprints that would be identifiable to a couple of young kids. Just after our incident, maybe a couple of weeks later, I remember seeing on the news about a Bigfoot sighting at Cherry Glen Campground, not too far from our house. Also, sightings in the Adel, Iowa area the previous November that also made the news. We do not know what was out there that night, but my mother remarked how funny it seemed to happen between two sighting occurrences in the area. The swamp is now mostly developed into a housing area nestled in between Fatal High School and Northeast 60th Avenue in Thaler Township. I thought this story, which is quite well known among my old school buddies, would maybe complement the other stories in central Iowa at the same time. It's not dramatic or filled with terror, but it sure shook me up for a couple of weeks after, as me and my friends were sure, it was a Bigfoot. We never looked at that gloomy old swamp the same way again. I also noticed slow walking in dry reeds outside of the scope of the porch light, two large mean dogs belonging to our neighbors trying to attack whatever it was by the swamp, but kept being forcefully repulsed several times, returning to the safety of our backyard, only to attack it again. There had been other sightings in the area, most definitely November, sightings at Adele, at Adel, then our encounter, then a sighting at Cherry Glen, Sailorville Lake, by a park employee. Our encounter was never reported to anyone but friends, but the Adel and the Cherry Glen sightings both made the news. It was about 3 a.m., poor lighting, back porch light, fair weather, high 30s for temperature. It was in an unplanted cornfield with swamp behind, lots of dry reed, and overgrown storm-damaged trees. On to the next one. Eldridge, Iowa is 10 miles north of Davenport, Iowa. I was a paper boy for the Des Moines Register. I would usually start my route at about 5 a.m. in the morning. About a week prior to this incident, I started having this feeling that I was being watched and even followed, though I never saw or heard anything up to this point. On this particular morning, about halfway through my route, I came around the corner of Fifth Street and Donahue Avenue. Riding my bike loaded with newspapers, when I looked down and saw this trail of very large footprints in the snow, I got off my bike and knelt down and took a closer look, thinking that this was some kind of prank. I even counted the number of toes, five on each foot, and it looked just like a human footprint, only much larger. The prints were about 6 to 8 inches wide and about 18 to 24 inches long. I remember I slowly stood up and looked around and noticed the tracks came in from the northeast side of Eldridge and cut through people's backyards and exited the southwest side of town. I remember feeling very alone and scared out of my mind. The worst was yet to come later in the week when I had to deliver the Sunday paper. After school that day, I went back and followed the track northeast to southwest all the way through Eldridge and across a small park called Elmer Green Park. It was here that the reality of what I had just discovered really started to sink in. When the tracks came to a four-foot high fence on the other side of the park, you could see that the creature just stepped over it like it wasn't even there. I followed the tracks all the way back to the city Eldridge sewer treatment pond where I usually hunted rabbits. The tracks followed Hickory Creek 
around behind the sewer treatment pond, and it was here that I stopped following the tracks out of fear because I was alone. That night, I went out collecting money for my paper route, and I made it a point to go to the location where I had originally found the track that morning. I remember it all like it happened yesterday. I looked at my watch and noted it was 10.30 p.m. when I went home to bed. The next morning, I arrived back at the same location at about 5.30 a.m., and to my shocking surprise, there was a new set of tracks in the snow following the original set in reverse. Now, I was really scared. My first thought was, I have to get the heck out of here, but my second thought was, this thing is following. You see the path that this Bigfoot took paralleled my newspaper route, and I lived across the street from the park where it stepped over the fence. To say the least, I was scared out of my eighth grader mind. I remember this had happened on Wednesday, and the return track had to have happened between 10.30 Wednesday night and 5.30 a.m. Thursday morning. Needless to say, this creature remained nearby in the area. I remember the rest of the week was uneventful with no more new track sightings, but I did feel like I was being watched and followed. Then that Sunday, my father helped me deliver the Sunday papers because they were so much bigger that I couldn't carry them all on my bike. So dad drove the car while I ran them up to the door. Everything went just fine that morning, and I was feeling pretty secure because I had my dad with me until we got to the last house on my paper route on the south side of Eldridge, behind North Scott Junior High School. I remember running the paper up to the front door and tossing it just a little too hard. It hit the front door with a bang. As soon as it hit the door, the noise must have startled the Bigfoot because it let out a horrifying scream. It was just around the corner of the house between the house I had just delivered to and the house next door and behind it just where I couldn't see it. I knew it was that close because of the horrifying scream it let out. I have never been so scared in all my life. I ran as hard as I could back to the car, slipping and sliding on the snow and ice, and I hit the car so hard I shook it. Me running into and hitting the car scared my dad, but when I screamed, Did you hear it screaming, Dad? He said he didn't, because he had the heater blower going full blast and the radio turned up, so he didn't hear it at all. I couldn't believe it. I decided right then and there that morning I would get out of the newspaper delivery business. I turned the route over to another kid a couple months later in April. I'll never forget the look of those tracks or that scream from hell that it makes. It all seemed like it just happened yesterday. I never saw it during this encounter, and for the next week or two, I felt like I was still being watched and followed. The weather conditions during the week were bitter cold. I remember it was between zero and negative 15 degrees the entire week. There was little to no wind that week, and we had about 8 to 12 inches of snow on the ground. There was no moon that week as well, but we did have crystal clear starry skies the entire week at night. I did not see the creature during this encounter. I only saw the tracks in the snow, and I did hear it scream. I did not notice any pungent smells from the creature, which would make sense, being that it was winter time and the air was cold and dry. It would not be until the fall when I had my second encounter with Bigfoot that ran across the road in front of my car one night while driving down a gravel road in the southern Rocky Mountains in southern New Mexico. During that encounter, I had a girlfriend with me that saw it too. I'm 40 years old now, and that week and that scream live with me until this very day, like it happened yesterday. Every time I go hunting, I keep an eye out for them because I know they're in my area. The Bigfoot sighting in Buchanan County, Iowa, is about 30 to 50 miles northwest from an area that I hunt just west of McQuokita, Iowa. In July, a farmer who raises cattle and rents pasture lands on the farm I hunt heard a horrifying scream while out checking his cattle. He said it gave him the willies and he said he got out of there as fast as possible. I haven't seen any evidence of any Bigfoot activity in the area that I hunt, but 
I have my suspicion, being that it is only a short walking distance in Bigfoot terms from the Buchanan County sighting location. Just like many of you who have seen, heard, or found Bigfoot and its tracks, I too have been made fun of and laughed at when I have told friends or family members of my Bigfoot encounter. I know that I am not crazy. I have a college degree and another one on the way. I served in the U.S. military and was honorably discharged. I have never used any illegal drugs or abused any legal drugs in my life, nor have I ever been drunk a day or moment in my life. I know what I saw, heard, and found, and now I know that they really do exist. I need no further proof. I found the first set of tracks at 5.30 in the morning and found the second set of tracks at 5.30 a.m. the next morning. Four days later, Sunday morning at 6 a.m., I heard the scream. The weather conditions during the week were bitter cold. I remember it was between zero and negative 15 degrees the entire week. There was little to no wind that week, and we had about 8 to 12 inches of snow on the ground. There was no moon that week as well, but we did have crystal clear starry skies the entire week at night. On to the next one. Late at night, in Saratoga Springs, in Saratoga County, New York, on the Winchester Trail state land, my boyfriend Jeff and I were walking home from a concert off Route 50. We decided to cut through the Winchester Trail. The trail leads behind the property to Geyser Crest to where we both lived back then. It was 9 to 10 p.m. when we hit that trail in pitch dark, and it gives me chills to think back, but I'd like to share this story if it helps in any way. As soon as we reached the trail, off to the right and down an embankment in the dense woods, something was moving, and as it walked, the ground shook. It was getting closer to us and seemed like it could see us but we couldn't see it. Then we heard trees being snapped as we ran, parallel to where we were running, and it chased us almost all the way out of the trail. We were very scared and continued running and could barely see where we were running. No one would believe us when we told the story. We decided to go back the next day during daylight hours just to confirm what we thought happened down there when we got there the next day, there were several 7 by 5 inch circumference footprints. Some were the size of a man's neck. Green saplings snapped in half, coming up the trail from where we were running. We immediately thought Bigfoot, even though we didn't actually see any creature. And they were snapped off a good 4 to 5 inches up from the base of the trees, so they had to be snapped off by something that was standing on its hind legs. We checked for footprints, but didn't go too far down there to inspect the area out of fear. But you could clearly see the trees were snapped right off as if they were only twigs. The area was densely wooded and wet forest trail through the middle, beaver dams, and several acres of forest off train tracks between Route 50 and Hathorne Boulevard. We saw no creature. On to the next one. A couple from Avril Park saw a large upright figure that was tall and reddish blonde in color and running very quickly near Poston Kill in Wren Sealer County in New York. On to the next one. A teenage boy saw a seven-foot-tall creature that peeked at him as he walked along a road in Hampton in Washington County in New York. Also in Hampton, two teenagers out camping saw a six-foot-tall creature with glowing red eyes circle their tent. On to the next one. Huge bipedal tracks measuring more than 20 inches long, were found in the snow by a farmer near Ghent in Columbia County. 
A few days later, similar tracks were found that trailed off into a thicket in the same area. On to the next one. In Pine Bush in New York, separate witnesses had seen on a road a black creature about seven to nine feet tall with a head, arms, and legs. The witness could not make out any features it ran off into the woods after being seen. This is an area of heavy UFO activity as well. On to the next one. At 10.30 p.m. in the winter, in Pine Bush in Crawford in Orange County in New York, three women parked near the house watched a black form or huge something with head, arms, and legs, and hands like mittens that floated right past their car. They both screamed as they saw it. It then seemed to float and disappear near the house, never setting off the sensor light. All three women give the same description. On to the next one. In Pine Bush in New York. Two young women had gotten home from school and were waiting for their mother to arrive with only their dog in the house. Something knocked on the front door. One of them looked and saw a tall black figure with hands, legs, but she could not make out any features. She ran and hid under her bed, but whatever it was walked around and knocked on the back door. She stayed under her bed for 15 or 20 minutes and when she looked outside, the thing was kind of squatting in her driveway and just got up and walked away and disappeared into the woods. On to the next one. In late September, in the Chattanooga National Forest in New York, it was late September, and I was visiting friends who lived at the edge of the Chattanooga National Forest Chattooga National Forest is probably not listed on the New York Forest Registry because it is technically on Senka National Reservation property. My friend and I had gotten up early to hike one of the nature trails that go throughout the park. This part of western New York is about an hour south of Buffalo and in between the Senka Nation. The tourist season of the summer had ended and it was not yet deer hunting season but the foliage was still thick. My friend and I started on the trail early, around 6.30 a.m. in the morning. It was still dusk outside, and the sun was just beginning to rise. After about 20 minutes into our hike, we had come to what looked like a marsh-like environment with fallen trees and some open spaces. We had stopped to survey the area, just looking around at how beautiful the scenery was. I would like to say at this point that my friend, who is also a professional photographer, wished he had brought his camera, and in a few moments, I wished he had as well. As we stood there, we got the strange sense that we were being watched. I thought this strange considering the remoteness of the area and how early it was. As I turned around to see what was behind us, we heard of movement in the bushes. At this point, I thought it was a bear. Bigfoot had not entered my mind at all. We both began to make a lot of noise and talking loud enough so that if it was a bear, it would run off instead of charging. After a while, we realized that it was not a bear or any other animal because with all the noise we were making, whatever was in the thicket had not moved. At this point, we thought it had to be a human. But as we neared the thicket, about 50 feet from where we were standing, we heard heavy breathing and saw through the thicket what appeared to be a large, dark form either lying down or squatting. My friend became very frightened, and even at this point, Bigfoot had not entered either of our thoughts. My friend urged me to continue down the original trail and back to where we had started. We were already deep into the woods and 
had at least another good 20 minutes of brisk walking or running if whatever was in the bushes decided to follow us. As we started down the trail, whatever was in the bushes darted behind the nearest tree and began to follow us. After a few minutes of this, it became aggravating. So my friend and I thought we would stop and hide behind the nearest tree we could find to see what this thing would do. As I peered out from behind the side of this tree, what I saw is something I will never forget. When I stared at the tree and bushes that this thing was hiding behind, I will not say well at what appeared to be the six-foot level of a branch was a dark, hairy shoulder and part of a massive forearm. At this point, I knew exactly what I was looking at. It was a seven-foot-tall Sasquatch, and with all my nerve, I tried to get my friend to see from my angle. When my friend moved over to my side to get a look, this creature moved just enough to see its torso, and that was all my friend needed to see, and he took off. I was left standing there, wondering if the reports of these things chasing people were true. But all it did was stand there, waiting for me to make my move. This was the point I was scared the most. I did not know what to do, so I began to talk out loud and say, We are not here to hurt you. We're just moving through. I said this in a calming voice, despite the fact that my nerves were frayed as they could be. I started down the trail in a calm walking gait, and the Sasquatch kept right up with me, about 75 feet behind me, always staying just out of my line of view. It stopped following me about a half a mile from the end of the trail. When I caught up with my friend, he was too shaken up to talk about it, and has never mentioned it again. I've been back to the area since this incident, and my friend will not go into the woods by himself, and only with a great number of people. I would like to add that there was no smell associated with this sighting and no vocalization, only heavy breathing and what sounded like a low guttural grunt, and some form of what sounded to me to be lip smacking. Several months later, I had read that in Jamestown, New York, there had been a sighting of a white Bigfoot that chased a group of kids off a bike path not far from where I had my sighting. On to the next one. In Chattarugas County in New York, the three witnesses were hunting deer in the southern tier when they thought they saw a bear coming out from behind a nearby tree. But the creature ran on two feet and was making ungodly noises as it ran after the witnesses. It nearly caught up to them as they reached their truck before they could leave. The creature smashed out the front window of the truck. They described the creature as a mix between a gorilla and a man with bright yellow, evil-looking eyes. On to the next one. Myself and six friends were camping at Pine Pond in the lower Saranac Lake region. It was around dusk and my friend and I were fishing in our canoe. The other members of our party were at camp preparing supper about a quarter of a mile away through the forest from our location. On the canoe in the middle of the lake, my friend and I were speaking openly, not attempting to be quiet in any way. I was scanning the northern bank of the lake, which I knew quite well, when I noticed a strange shape on the edge of the wood line. It was about 50 yards away. I immediately pointed it out to my friend, and he spotted it instantly. The shape was about three and a half feet off the ground at its highest point. At first, we both thought it was a black bear standing broadside, but after a few seconds, I realized that was not the case. We started to row toward it somewhat cautiously, just as my friend whispered, it's a bear, the thing stood up. It had been crouching there on its feet like a catcher from a baseball team. It was about seven feet tall 
and was very dark brown in color. Its face was hairy, yet fleshy around the upper cheeks. Its eyes were dark in color, but clearly visible and had a brightness about them. Upon talking afterward, we both agreed that we saw slight movements of its head and hands. It stood there for what seemed like ten seconds looking at us. It tilted its head slightly up as if it were sniffing the air. As if all this wasn't strange enough, we then heard the snapping of twigs about fifty feet behind it. The creature turned its torso to the left and looked up to its side. It immediately turned back toward us and then spun 180 degrees around and darted into the wood line like a cat. We then heard the sounds of movement for about 10 more seconds, then we heard nothing. To this day, I have no idea what makes the noise behind it. After staying put in the canoe for about 10 minutes, my friend decided, against my wishes, to paddle to the spot on shore and investigate for tracks. There were only two discernible markings in the sand, which were obscured from the pivoting of its feet when it turned around. The whole experience was very, very upsetting. Although I can honestly say it did not attempt to threaten us in any way, it was still scary as heck. That night, I did not sleep one wink because I was so focused on every little noise that I heard. The next day, we left. The other people in our party are convinced we saw a bear. It was no bear. It was approximately 8 p.m., well into dusk period. Sun was below horizon, but the sky illuminated. It had been a typical clear, sunny summer day. The area is mixed coniferous, mixed deciduous, dry, thick underbrush, under tall, dense forest. Difficult to bushwhack off the trail. On to the next one. Three witnesses were terrified by a frightening monster for over 20 minutes one night in Beattyville, Kentucky, back in 1957. Phyllis was a passenger in an old truck struggling through the rain and mud of White Ash Hill. Her grandmother was in the front seat, as well as her uncle who was driving. It was about 11 p.m., and Phyllis would end up waiting nearly 50 years to report what she saw that night. The road was dirt and mud in those days, she later said. It was raining and muddy. My uncle was having a hard time getting up the hill to where we intended to leave the truck and travel on foot, as usual, to the top of the hill to their home. Something very large and frightening would run back and forth across the road in front of our truck and throw branches from the holly thickets on one side of the road. This continued for 20 to 30 minutes, until my uncle finally managed to back down the hill. Upon checking the next morning, the road was a muddy mess, but you could certainly tell something had gotten mad and stomped around. Broken branches were everywhere. Phyllis described the frightening creature as being large, dark-colored, guessed to be nine to ten feet tall and very angry. It was hard to see more. I was a child and very frightened. My uncle and grandmother refused to tell anyone. They thought they would not be believed. Bettyville seems to be the hot spot for Lee County. In 2001, a resident listened to a series of screams and roars issued from the woods near his home for over 30 minutes made by at least two creatures which he felt sure were Bigfoot. Another resident claimed that he saw a tall, hair-covered werewolf on October 3rd, 2009 while deer hunting in Beattyville with his uncle and brother. On to the next one. It was a dark and stormy night. The rain beat down hard on the tin roof of the little guard shack located on the mountains of Kentucky near Whitesburg. It was just about midnight on September 1st, 2003, when the unknown intruder approached the shack. Inside sat the security guard, who had just returned from making his rounds and doing the paperwork. He was just relaxing despite the damp. 
just listening to the rain. That's when I heard a loud crunching sound beside the shack, he later said. So I stood up and watched the shadow from under the sides of the shack. It was moving toward the door. A few seconds later, it was trying to open the door by pulling on it. That's when I yelled, what do you want? That was when I heard the most terrifying sound ever, like a screaming howl. And then it began to pull harder on the door. According to the witness, a feeling of pure dread came over him then, such as he had never felt before in his life. I got a poker and put it in the coal stove that was our heat source for the shack. It got red glowing hot. I told whatever it was what I had and was going to do with it if it opened the door. After a few minutes, it got quieter and I watched its shadow move from under the door. After several minutes had passed with no activity, the man made a decision to get to the safety of his car as fast as possible. I threw open the door of the guard shack so that the light from inside would show a little outside and made a run for my car. I got in, locked the door, started it up, put it in drive, and got on the CB radio to inform the other guards of what I had just encountered. I stayed the rest of the night in my car. The next morning, when my relief showed up, I informed him of what I had encountered, and I looked for footprints, but the heavy rain made it difficult to find any that would be useful. But I know what it was without a doubt. It was a Sasquatch. The man also claimed that he later learned that several other security guards who refused to work at the site due to other strange happenings there. The area consists of strip mines, mountains, and woods. Three campers were surprised by something they weren't expecting at about 1 a.m. on the morning of June 4, 2006, as they were enjoying the outdoors of Ermine, Kentucky. Dustin, along with two buddies, Neil and Aaron, were up on the mountain camping out for the night. Then, all of a sudden, we heard something running down a big, long field of grass. We all heard it, so we run down closer to see what the heck it was. Then, after we got closer, we saw it walking down the road. It was running like no man could run. It also was screeching and making a lot of banging noises in the distance. He reported the sighting that very night, describing the thing as a big brownish-black creature that was very large in size. It was probably seven to eight feet tall. It was running very fast through the field like no man could run. It was screeching and making a lot of noises in the distance. On to the next one. Lewis County played host to a creature described as being five or six feet tall, stocky and covered in black hair back on May 20th, 1969. It was observed by three people as they were engaged in taking a walk that sunny afternoon. I was about five or six taking a walk with my older brother and sister, one witness later stated. Near our house was an abandoned house. As we were about to pass it, we saw a black figure on the porch. My brother and sister ran, and I followed them as fast as I could. Our dad went back after we got home to check things out, but saw nothing. Around this time, there were some strange sounds heard at night that dad called a wildcat. Also, we raised a garden, and we found that something was picking corn, taking it to the end of the garden and shucking it to eat. My second oldest brother told me that when he was a boy, he saw what he called a gorilla looking in the windows one night. This would have been in the 1940s or 50s, a gigantic man-like figure covered with shaggy reddish-brown hair was reportedly witnessed by a school bus driver in Vanceburg, Kentucky on two separate occasions back in the late 1970s. On the second occasion, he described the beast that he'd seen as a big thing with matted, patchy, red-brown hair like it had been burned. Both the sightings allegedly took place on or near Vanceburg Hill. Another such creature was observed near Concord, Kentucky on May 21, 2008. It was about 4 p.m. when Jimmy, 
was digging yellow root on Route 57. I walked up a hill to avoid crossing a deep hollow, he stated. As I got to the top and started down the other side, I could see a field. When I got close to the field, I could smell a strong odor. I walked to the field and saw what I thought was a bear, but when it stood up to walk to the other side, I knew it was no bear. I've seen a lot of bears before. The witness yelled loudly and the figure stopped, turned its head and looked at him. Then it made a high-pitched sound and turned and walked away very quickly. As I came to the other side of the field, it made grunting sounds, the witness claimed. I thought for maybe 20 seconds more. It walked into a grove of cedars and disappeared. Jimmy described the thing as seven to eight feet tall with long reddish colored hair covering its body. It had big shoulders and long arms which reached its knees. He estimated that it must have weighed 400 to 500 pounds. He also recalled that it walked with big stride and he saw two human looking footprints that it left behind. Moreover, he claimed that he had seen the same type of creature in the area when he was a kid. On May 20th, 2007, another Kentucky couple caught a glimpse of the unknown while returning home from a friend's house in Olive Hill, Kentucky. Me and my wife were driving along Route 59, about two miles from Route 1662, the witness later exclaimed. When a tall creature walked in front of our car, my wife screamed, Bear! Bear! I told her it was no bear. It stood on its hind legs. The creature stood in the road for about 40 to 45 seconds, then walked across the road to the field to the right. I got out and got my spotlight and gave it to the wife for me. I followed the creature to the creek where it walked up a real steep hill. I couldn't follow any more. All night, last night, we heard strange growls and squeals. The dogs barked all night. The witnesses described the creature as seven to eight feet tall, brownish red in color, 400 to 500 pounds with long arms and broad shoulders. Another hairy humanoid was seen in Lewis County in the spring of 2008. Moreover, the witness claimed that himself and his children had been getting glimpses of the thing at their home on Firebrick Road near South Portsmouth, Kentucky for the past three or four months. He described the beast as seven to eight feet tall with no neck and covered in grayish black hair. A horrible smell, like a cross between a skunk and rotten meat, was associated with the beast and the horses and dogs were badly frightened when it was in the area. It always walked on two legs and the witnesses felt sure that the creature was responsible for his missing livestock. On to the next one. The First Nations people of Canada, of course, have their legends of what we might call fairy beings. The Manigishi little people of the Cree of Eastern Canada delight in playing jokes on travelers. Nagwamsuk, a species of fae similar to the Passamaquoddy native peoples that were said to sometimes aid hunters and fishermen, but with one important caveat. These little people were said to be ugly and the person encountering them had to remember not to laugh on seeing them. While it is not mentioned what might happen to one who laughs at a Nagamwasuk, we can extrapolate from other fairy lore to surmise that the result would not be pleasant. Fairy in Celtic lands were known to smite those who crossed them with bad luck or even death. The Canadian Inu knew of a being they called the Apsi Inuk. This creature had a reputation for stealing children in the mountains of Labrador, while Gyo Lud Mothisig of New Brunswick was a brownie-like being. The brownies of Europe were known for being helpful around the house if given proper offerings, usually milk or porridge. The Mi'kmaq people believed that one could reach the land of stone and dwarfs via a cave system. Scottish and Irish settlers may have learned of the indigenous legend, particularly about the stone dwarf, and chosen a place name 
that overlaid their cultural lore over the local First Nations lore. Fairy lore is strong on the Maritime Coast, to give an idea of how strong the lore of the fairy is in the area. The whole district, which that town of Inverness now covers, was formerly called Shane, from the Gaelic Sithine, meaning House of the Fairies. In the district, there was a small hill, shaped something like a large haystack, where old people used to see the little people in thousands. People in general would not walk about in the place at night, but when they did so, as soon as they approached the hill, the little visitors vanished. A man who owned a farm at that place was so much troubled by the noise of no natural description that he sold his place in order to get rid of them. Note, too, that both First Nation people of Canada and the Celtic settlers both refer to their visitors as little people. People who lived side by side with these beings took great care never to call them by name, but instead referred to those ones as the little people, the fairy folk, the people of peace, and other local monikers. Tales of trickster fairy who seemed to range through all of Nova Scotia. In one story, a peddler who made his rounds of the countryside in a wagon drawn by a gray horse had stopped for the night at the home of a Mr. McNeil. The horse was well stabled, but in the morning, McNeil discovered that the horse's mane had been plated. When McNeil mentioned this to the peddler, the man shrugged it off as something that happened each night no matter where he went on the island or how secure the horse's accommodations were. The peddler ascribed the plating to the fairy who used a counter charm to get the horse's mane back to normal. Water in which silver coins had been placed. Silver is a conductive metal that is said in the magical traditions to disrupt dense etheric patterns such as one might find in a fairy manifestation. The etheric level is the plane closest to our own in a cult throughout and is the place where certain beings, such as the fairy, can gather substance to themselves before slipping into our world. One presumes that if silver can disrupt the etheric body of fey manifestation, it can also disrupt fey magic. The old peddler was not the only one upon whom the fairy played tricks. A fellow from the old country went out reaping one day in a field of his farm and discovered that all the haystacks from the previous day were upside down. The man was dumbfounded and stated later that I didn't think we had any of the little people in this part of the world. Here comes another Nova Scotia story. This account seems to have been used been of beings that some called leprechaun. I seen a little fellow about two feet three inches high. He had a little green coat on him and a little red skull cap. He had a stick in his hand, so I wondered who he was and where he came from and what his name was. Then I remembered about leprechaun. He is the fairy guardian of all buried treasure and money. If you can look him straight in the face, and look him square in the eye, you'll get a lot of money. But you must never take your eye off him. I followed him. I said to him, take me to a pot of gold. He had tried to take me because I had my eye right on him, so he went on. But then a noise in the thicket made me withdraw my gaze for a moment. When I looked again, the leprechaun was gone. So was the money. Here's the story of a fairy being said to dwell on the legendary Oak Island off the coast of Nova Scotia. The hunt for the treasure on the island seems to be ongoing, but there have also been some odd episodes reported here and there, such as a couple who, in September of 1973, were walking near the location where another person had reported running into an invisible wall. The couple did not encounter the wall, but they did see a small beardless man dressed in white, including his large seven-league boots. He was accompanied by a larger man dressed in black with a cloak and three-cornered hat. 
the strange duo was spotted a couple of years later in another location on the island. While Faye playing tricks and appearing as little people may not seem threatening, remember that the Scots also believed that there were fairies who belonged to the unseelie court. Those fairies who had no love of human beings, one of those legends transferred over to Prince Edward Island in the legend of the Slaw. In the original Scottish legend, the Slaw was simply the host of the unforgiven dead, somewhat similar to the wild hunt of other areas, who were said to be able to transport those caught outside into the afterlife, or if they were very lucky, to a remote place. Yet, Another way that people might disappear mysteriously, on Prince Edward Island, the slaw are seen as a flight of black birds that are said to be able to accomplish this feat. In an echo of the missing 401 cases, those who survived an encounter with the slaw often had no memory of how they came to be in another location. The big swamp in Bayfield was also said to be a haunt of the slaw, and many people had run-ins with this powerful force near the swamp. Ronnie Gillis was once walking through the swamp at night when suddenly he found himself miles away with no memory of how he had got there. In another instance, John Joe McPhee was walking from Rock Barra to Bayfield past the swamp when a cold wind hit him. After that, he had no memory of what happened, and when he came to his senses, he found himself lost in the depths of the swamp, and it took him hours to find his way out. Interestingly, one noted preventative technique for keeping the slaw from taking you was to roll up the legs of your pants. In Celtic fairy lore, there is a similar technique in which the person who fears being taken by the fairy avoids them by turning their clothes or simply their coat inside out. Also fascinating is that the slaw is always said to come from the west, the direction in which souls are said to depart to the afterlife in a number of traditions. Another way of fending off the slaw was to keep any west-facing windows firmly shut at night. Even in more modern times, it is still a superstition on Prince Edward Island to cross your crows, that is, to make the sign of the cross over crows cross your path to ward off bad luck. It is also considered to be a good idea to roll up one's car window when passing through the slaw haunted Bayfield. Places like Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island were heavily settled by the Scots and Irish. It is obvious, in even a glance, that the First Nations people of Canada have their own traditions of little people that seem to align in at least some aspects with the lore of Celtic fairy. These beings can be tricksy, but if treated with the proper respect, can also be helpful. It's also true that if offended, the little people seem to have been able to make the offender's life miserable. All these traits are noted in the Celtic fairy lore as well. Apparently, Scottish fairy seers, individuals who worked with the fairies in various ways, including healing, often felt that they had lost their fairy contact when they were forcibly relocated to the new world. It turned out, though, that these contacts were not lost, but ended up renewing themselves after the seer had been in the new world for a while. It seemed to those seers that it was almost as if their contacts had to seek and find them before renewing their relationship. It is suspected that the Scots and Irish of Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island had a similar experience when they moved to the New World, and that their native fairy, or ones much like them, returned to make their lives interesting in their new home. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much.
And until next time, bye!